I'm going live, it's five o'clock. Good luck. There we go. Are we gonna get a introduction or we are introducing ourselves, I forget. <laughs> Whole thing is self service cushion. <laughs> we'll just wait for a minute for oh, the other people logging in. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, we have a few people. There's still more people logging in, but shall we start? How many? How many people, roughly? So we have around three hundred registered. Um. So hello, everyone. A very, very good evening to all of you here. On behalf of Thai Dubai, I am more than pleased to extend a very warm welcome to each of you here. Part of our Thai Women MENA program, today's session promised to be very exciting, always a popular topic, and there is never enough for fundraising and scaling if you think big and global and you're on the lookout to join the unicorn wagon. I will not take time, too much time out for the introduction. Don't want to take time out from our two brilliant speakers lined up for today both of who will very nicely frame both the sides of the coin when you are an investor and when you are a startup trying to raise funds. A little bit about Thai, for those who do not know, in a nutshell, Thai is an organization that fosters entrepreneurship globally. What started as a conversation, a small gathering in Silicon Valley in 1992, has now turned into more than 60 chapters in 14 countries. So how Thai functions is majorly on five main, main pillars, mentoring, networking, education, funding, and incubation. While Thai has a global reach, we make sure each chapter gets to focus on the local ecosystem. There are some great programs which we run for all the entrepreneurs here in the UAE and across the wider MENA region. The mentorship program, extremely beneficial for companies that are looking for support from seasoned and successful entrepreneurs who will help you navigate your startup journey better. The Thai University program, now running in its phase two, where we are mentoring the top teams who are all university students and on their way to be entrepreneurs. We have been talking about the Thai Women MENA program 2022 for a while now. Today is the last day of applications. It is an amazing program that focuses on women-led or co-led companies. If you are a woman entrepreneur, do make sure you be a part of this program. You would have seen the screen flipping where you can see that the global finals, the winner goes on to win $100,000 equity free in cash. If you are a woman entrepreneur, make sure you apply. You can go to, we'll share the links on the chat soon. Um, the website thaidubai.org and thaiwomen.org, the applications are there. And if you do a woman entrepreneur who is, has a potential, please do share it with them as well. We have already received over hundreds of applications. We will start the evaluation process because I know a lot of the applicants would be here as well. This is a learning curve for them, this session. Uh, we will be announcing end of July, early August, who would be the shortlisted candidates. Do keep an eye out for more sessions, clinics, panels, workshops, 
So follow us on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, look out for Thai Dubai everywhere. As I was saying, Thai Dubai is the Middle East chapter of Thai based in Dubai Internet City and has been around for almost 20 years now. Uh, the easiest way to be a part of this community is follow us as Thai Dubai everywhere. And I can see a lot of family names in the attendee list, a lot of applicants, it's great to see them and a lot of our charter members as well, especially the ones who are here today and to all the board members who make all the amazing things happen at Thai Dubai. Thank you and welcome. <laughs> Moving on to our speakers for today, who are Thai Dubai charter members, I am pleased to introduce Rayat Hafiz and Kushal Shah. Rayat, with over 25 years of experience in managing large scale technology development and leading large commercial operations, Rayat Hafiz is El Grocer's CEO, the leading online grocery marketplace in the UAE. Rayat's deep tech know-how as well as practical and operational business sense is driving El Grosa to continue its leadership with cutting edge customer experiences and brand engagement opportunities. Prior to joining El Grosa, Riot led a local management consulting firm that helped some of the largest regional enterprises in FMCG, insurance, telecom, and healthcare to engage in digital transformation activities. Previously, Riot led the Middle East and Africa region for Motorola Mobility, a Google company, where he turned around and delivered a profitable and growing business. An MBA from the world-renowned Kellogg Business School of Management and a computer engineer from Iowa State University, Riot's wealth of hands-on technical experience and operational business insight have proven a significant asset for his clients and companies. And the next profile as well, it's all heavy introductions that I have to do today. Kushal Shah is the head of CVC at EN Capital. He's one of the founders of Dubai Angel Investors and an investment committee member of several VC firms. He's one of the pioneers of venture investing in the MENA region and has a well-established reputation with founders and investors. Prior to joining, he and he was also the head of digital and technology at Roland Berger for the Middle East and Asia region. Kush studied economics at Cambridge and is also a chartered accountant, which I found out today. He enjoys participating in technology disruption and expects the next five to 10 years to be the most transformative we have ever seen. Welcome, and I will leave it to you to tell the audience the flow. Basically, it would be conversational style. And we are, please have your questions coming through the Q&A wherever it's relevant, and we'll take it at the end of the session. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, Thank you, Cecily. All right, let's have fun today. And, Absolutely. Uh, it's a, you know, when Cicely was saying it's always a topic, I thought she was going to talk about food and money, which is what we love, right? So that's that's always the topic of conversation. <laughs> that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. So, so uh, and, 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 and there you are as a founder in a play, in, in something that you're passionate about, something that we're all passionate about, the food. <laughs> so it must be fun to be a founder in, in, in a thing that you're passionate about. What do you feel? It, it's a blast. It was, you know, when we started, uh, we started back in 2015 when, you know, groceries online wasn't really that popular. And it took us quite a while to convince people that this is going to be, uh, you know, a common uh, user habit to be ordering groceries online. And then, uh, you know, 2020 happened and everybody knew this was essential. And then you got the competition to come in and, 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 uh, and it's, it's becoming a crowded space. So it, we, we've gone through a lot of, uh, you know, changes uh, for, for just uh, that, that space. But, uh, but I mean, you're no stranger to that, right? You're, you're, <laughs> you've been seeing those changes also whether it's in Roland Berger or in, during your, uh, you know, Dubai Angel investment. So you've seen, you've seen the, the marketplaces coming up and down. 
uh, I'm, in, I'm interested also in, in hearing more about your, your, your new journey, you know, and uh, now as, as running a, a, a significant venture arm, you know, what's, what's your outlook on, on uh, the startups that are out there? What are you looking for? <laughs> I, I want to make an analogy. It came up because when we entered this conversation a few minutes ago and, and to the audience, so when we set up the, 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 the call and ride, I saw Ride's grocery bag and I was like, I was immediately hungry. Uh, I, I didn't have lunch, so I had to go and make a coffee and you know, have a bit of chocolate because I got hungry. I wonder, I would love to understand the stats when, when does spikes happen in a day? Is it when people get hungry? Is the basket bigger when people are hungry? But the analogy I want to make is investing is a little bit like that. Um, there is hunger and then there is famine. Or, or rather, they, there's famine and, and it's up and down. It's very cyclical. Everybody leaps at investments and then everybody disappears. Everybody becomes cautious. Everybody throws money at it. And we see those cycles and sometimes we forget these cycles exist. Sometimes they exist in a, in a narrow time window and sometimes they exist in a long time window. And it's been a very long time window. So it's interesting that we're now coming across a different time window and and we have a new a new kind of uh, era to live with so in my case i think i started in in the region i started investing when in in about 2010 11 where a small gathering in in a street in a in a little restaurant and you would find the likes of ronaldo there or you'd find you know you'd find pretty much the few venturists and the few, the, the few um, entrepreneurs, and it would be fairly easy to say which restaurant, which coffee shop to go to find them and what kind of conversations that happen. Now I think every street corner has an entrepreneur and, and every street corner has an angel or as, a, as an investor. So the question is how to, how to um, mark yourself both as an investor as well as an as a entrepreneur, how to mark yourself, how to stand out above the crowd. No, hundred percent, and I think that's that's uh, it's a key challenge. I think most uh, entrepreneurs who are just getting into this may not be giving it its right attention. Right? Um, you're absolutely right. Well, you know, when when you started, when I started, I mean, I started into this space in 2012, and uh, still early times, and. Uh, uh, as you said, you know, the, all the faces were very, very familiar. Um, the the VCs, you can count them at that time on one hand, right? Yeah. And uh, um, you had some clear leaders, VCs, that you that you knew that they would be willing to take on some, uh, you know, bets on new new areas. Then you had. VCs or or funds or that were known as followers, right? And those would be the ones that are just you know if, if they invest, then I'll go and invest. So today that's a bit of a change. Um, I think uh, there's a number of startups that are out there, the number of you know parallel business models. As as a as a founder as a startup, you got to have a clear differentiator, and you got to you got to be able to now you know actually have some. Uh, in my view, some some clear fundamentals that you're able to to distinguish, and especially in the last twelve months, things are changed. Where I'd assume VCs are not as eager to just you know give away money, and they're looking for things that are have product market. You know, they're looking for businesses that actually can differentiate and them a competitive edge. And not necessarily just a copy of what has been done elsewhere, but a copy with localization or differentiation, or whole, ideally not even a copy. So, so um, it, it's changing, and it's it's very very diverse. Um, I wanted to ask you one thing, Kush. Is you know, as we said, money is getting tighter, and and uh, the race to just you know. Uh, uh, give you know, give money to the to the hottest uh, startup or the hottest model. The fad is is kind of uh, fading away. What is it 
you know, now that you are, you've, you've got a bit of less competition, I would say, on the investment, right? And and you're able to pick what is it that you're looking for? What I mean, let, yeah. let's let's start with the business. What is it that you're looking for in the business? And then we'll talk about the founder. Well, actually, let me start with uh, how we think as investors. Okay. And you have, uh, let's call it triangle. And let's type, let's assume each of the triangle spots has three different types of thinkers, investor thinkers. So there are, there are the financial investor thinkers who really think money and who really think about, uh, you know, how is this going to turn into profit? How is this cash going to become more cash? And, and how will it actually work really like, you know, pure numbers? And, and they're very good at it. And, and, and you will find that extremely sharp, kind of very money focused. Then you'll have those that are very corporate So they want to make sure the, the business has the right governance, the business has the right structure, the business has the right kind of partnerships going forward. And, and, and you know, the people are, are, are the right people to run that, et cetera. So th that's the ones that the corporate, and, and I'm seeing this, and I, by the way, in my whole experience, working with angels, working with venture capitalists, working with financiers, working with clients as corporates, you get all sorts of these people and whether you find a VC, he will be one of all of those three, she, and he or she will also have, in different times, will carry different weights of those three parts of the triangle. I didn't mention the third part. The third part is what I call the more venture-minded ones. So the more venture-minded ones are the ones that really look you as the founders deep in your eye and try to understand the passion you have, try to understand the the skills you have tried to mentor you, spend time with you, really catch that, that burn and then walk you through. So they're they betting on you. The financiers are betting on the money and the corporateers are, are betting on, on, on the structure that the organization, the operating model is good. Obviously, you want all of the three, but depending on which timeline you are and how hot the cycle is, one of those spikes more than the other. So today I would say the financial spike is more than the, the, the venture spike or the corporate spike now. But within your own journey, so if I was investing early stage versus late stage, so if you're an early stage uh, founder, we'll be looking at your eyes. We'll be looking at, you know, where is that fire in your eyes? Where is that passion? What are you driving? If things go wrong, will you have that energy and passion and capability? to pivot and all, all of that. That's what we'll be looking at. As you're kind of, let's say, going through the journey and you're raising later stage funding, then it's more like the corporate thinking, right? It's like, are they well organized? Are the founders fighting with each other? Is there kind of a good structure? Can this survive? Is this sustainable? That's kind of the more corporate kind of thinking. And then as you get even further, the, the, the big men, the, the big uh, money comes in and says, okay, Let's talk pure valuations. Let's talk, is the number right? Because when you're a venture, the number is based on how much you want to dilute. You know, how much can you afford to dilute and will pay, will, and how much you need to raise to make that dilution and the other way around. When you're late stage, it's what's the valuation? It's very much about the valuation. It's very much about today, this is the valuation. Today, the metrics that we're comparing you at, et cetera, et cetera. And tomorrow, what will be the valuation? How fast are you growing it? that sort of stuff. So these three things spike. <laughs> and in my journey, depending on who's on the investment committee, who's on the board, who's making these decisions, will carry different flavors. But what is the one thing that stands out and right in the time that I've known you, this is kind of the main thing. We always need the personality. We need that founder personality to come out and stand out. And it's not just about the fire. It's about being able to adapt to that tennis match that happens when you're raising the funding. You're, you're hitting the ball to the other side, you're waiting for the for financier to hit back and you're corresponding. And the closer you get, the more chemistry you build, the more, the more likely they're going to invest. And sometimes it's not one game that gets you there. You're gonna have to play 10 games. If you're lucky, you'll get it in one game, but let's, make, let's hope it's the, the right person in that game. No, hundred percent. I think I think I'm gonna take a wild guess that a lot of the people on the call here on the on the webinars are uh, early stage, um, and I think 
you know, the, the, the idea about, you know, the passion in their eyes is definitely something that's, that's, that's very, very important, but I don't think it's any, it's sufficient anymore. Right. So, I mean, uh, if we're looking at that founder and entrepreneur, right. How, how much are you looking, you know, uh, beyond passion? What, what are other traits? What is it that you think they need to have in order so that you would actually take them seriously and, you know, and, and, and take a look at what they've got to tell you. Excellent. Um, so uh, I'm going to get a little bit more on the techno technical side, but sorry, beyond the passion that people call in me, it's like, I wish there was some app that says, Hey, I'm on an important conference. Do not, do not bother me. Call, call me now. I wish there was a blocking, a blocking app, like how when you're driving, you could block people calling you. Anyway, um, to, to answer that, uh, we always have to look at unit economics. You have to look at the underlying business, understand, you know, from the revenue make, the costs are related to that revenue, the cost of acquiring the customers, so the, the margins that relate to closing the etc. So the unit economics is key. And usually most early stage startups, your unit economics are often negative and they will improve over time. And that improvement over time is driven by scale, is driven by your own learnings is driven by the kind of virality of, of, of what you have. And there is always this estimation that the margins will expand. And then reality, the margins sometimes contract because more competition comes in or you find new frictions coming into play that have some costs. So as investors, we always kind of put a, cons we take whatever people give us and we, we add the, 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 the conservativeness to, to watch out for all the risks that will come into play. So that's the unit economics. The second side is the technology. There is all, very often in early stage, and I've made that mistake many times, the story is very well polished. The, the structure, especially nowadays. So many startups, many founders go through some programs, some accelerator type programs. So the story gets well polished, they get mentored. They know how they know what to package but sometimes that's just the story you have to go a level deeper and in the old days i found this the founders were authentic because they haven't packaged their story they're just telling their story and then it's very authentic because they're, they're saying it as it is when it's packaged sometimes there's a bit of drama in it so so we have to look for the drama and then in the technology side you have to kick the tires because Sometimes the technology has debt in it. You know, the, what, what's often termed as tech debt. You are not fully teched out. There's enough manual elements that says, okay, this part is, is already technology. The rest is stuff that you have to do manual and you'll slowly, slowly over time build the technology out, which is fine. But we need to understand that and we need to understand that very clearly. The third thing is of course the people, you know, of course you're gonna look at the founder and, and, and all of the people around it and not just the founder, the entire, the entire uh, main team. Um, the valuation remains key because, I mean, with, with early stage, when we started, the valuations were, if, our, if you were lucky, the valuation was 1.1 million. You know, if you got north of a million valuation and you're raising 200K, you already, wow, you got your money, your business is worth a million dollars. You're already a millionaire, right? And about six months ago, I've seen so many pitches where the pitch is at 8 million. And it's still a pitch. And it's the same as ago. Of course, things have advanced, but inflation is 8x in that time. It's like 50 cents changing his name, right? So, um, uh, <laughs> so let's let's put this uh, 8x as being something that is concerning and hence you dig a lot deeper into the discussion uh, i think i mean valuations investments and all of that is, is definitely changed quite a bit I, I i remember when we started you know uh we've had to go through all different uh uh sources of investment so uh, I can appreciate that, uh, you know, as a VC, when you're looking at early stage, you know, it's, it's very different than when you're an angel or, you know, uh, uh, or other forms. But, Actually, uh, tell, us, tell us about your journey. Your, 
your raising journey from start to finish, the different channels, the different types of sources of funds. It will be fun to to hear that. And what was yeah, definitely hard? I mean, I'll I'll uh, tell you one thing. Is that, as I said, when we started, we started in this in a time where um, online for especially when it came to you know ordering other than e-commerce it meant food everybody was focusing on restaurant marketplaces at that time aggregators and so on uh it had just uh, recently they had just completed the transaction during talabat and so that was uh, that was the the focus and um so when we came and we said Look, it's groceries. It is a much smaller, you know, uh, margin, uh, and and uh, uh, you know, it's got a lot of a lot of operational complexities and so on. It, we definitely got you know uh, uh, you know challenges in, in raising funds. We we started with with almost everybody who you know bootstrapped and friends and family. You know, that's how we got our seed funding, but that was part of the. Uh, our, the mistake that kind of uh, we had to pay uh, had to pay you know the, the, for for a long time because uh, a business like ours requires significant upfront investment when it comes to communication brand awareness you're talking about a space that nobody was imagining ordering groceries online there was a operational cost involved we needed to raise a significant amount of funds to be able to uh, make a dent. And so, you know, uh, we actually launched at the very same time as our nearest competition, InstaShop. And uh, we, uh, they launched with a seed capital of 10 times what we had raised. And uh, we have been, you know, uh, that, that was kind of the, 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 the the difference in what what uh, changed the starting point for us. After we, you know, we we started looking into other forms of fundraising. Um, we actually were the very were very early uh, uh, startup that tapped into crowdfunding, and so crowdfunding was uh, just early stage at that point in time. We raised the largest crowdfund round that uh, was on a, on a local uh, platform here. And uh, in total, we had raised about 1.2 million in crowdfunding. So that was a significant amount of uh, effort for us. Um, throughout the years, as I said, we've gone through after, co after COVID, we gotten a lot more interest from both VC and corporates. And so we had actually raised from both. We raised from a corporate uh, uh, arm and we raised from a VC. And um, yeah, and then after that, as you all know, you know, or some of you may have known is we, we uh, finally got uh, acquired by uh, Tisalat Group. So we've gone through all of these. Um, I was, you know, there's a lot of learnings from from each of them as i said at the beginning make sure you take in consideration everything you do need to make sure you actually have a proper launch uh you know uh, uh, everything you do need to communicate and then you know uh, for every stage there is the right uh investment i think uh i would look at back at crowdfunding it isn't for everybody and i think there is a level of stage where you can engage it. Um, after that, it becomes too difficult to go and do. Um, so you know, it's it's uh, it's been quite interesting. And and you know, so when, actually, on those, which one took the longest? I mean, the one that took the longest, obviously, is VC fund VC and uh corporate uh believe it or not didn't take as long as the vc one took um in in general vcs here were very very hesitant as i said at the beginning they were focusing on food after covid we had a couple of you know monumental shifts with delivery here acquiring insta shop and then deciding to go into groceries 
And so whatever VCs had started looking into this, got spooked and uh, decided I'm not going to go and compete. So by end of 2020, the dust had settled and uh, we had gotten, you know, one VC to invest. But after that, pretty much everybody else decided that's not really the competitive landscape that we're interested in, in getting involved, getting stuck between Delivery Hero and Joe, if you will. Um, so that's that's what we found. I think a, a lot of the people on the on the chat uh, would love to understand a bit more about the crowdfunding and, uh, and who they were, etc. How what do they what do you have to do to prepare for that? Is it different from other sources of funding? It's very different. Um, in one way that you're having to educate. So again, we we raised crowdfunding very early on. We did it, I think, in 2017. When you know here it wasn't that common, and uh, a lot of the people that were investing were first-time you know investors. At that time, the platform itself uh, uh, needed to do a lot of education about what kind of form of investment is this, right? Um, so we we put a lot of heavy lifting in, in educating the investors and explaining all the risks and explaining what is what the business model is about, what the kind of returns you can expect and when you can expect them. We had people invest and in in less than six months say, hey, by the way, when am I going to get my profit checks, my dividend <laughs> checks? So it's uh, you know it's uh, so it's it's different type of investment profile. Um, you also, we also needed to do a lot of heavy lifting. I mean, you really, if you're going to go in crowdfunding, whatever you're going to raise, you need to make sure development behind the scenes is about 30 percent. He said it and forget it kind of thing. There is a lot of heavy lifting that needed to be done to make it happen. But yeah, it's it's it works for some, and and as I said, at a certain stage, it's no longer viable because either the money is too much, or you know that the risk appetite may not be the right one for for what. Uh, well, what, uh, un unlike is. food, there's never a point where the money is too much, right? <laughs> <laughs> the money requested is too much for for the, ah, crowd the money requested. Cool. Exactly, so, exactly. I mean, I've often had the situation where founders have said no to take extra funds uh, they the field evaluations too low so they, they wanted to limit it but circumstances always with hindsight they always felt maybe we should have taken that more money um, I think Any most time. of the times that's usually what I always advise people you get you get offered take it right uh, and by the way there is no concept of there's too much food you know, you can always order more, so it's, it's okay. You can have um, two bags instead of one. <laughs> exactly. We'll deliver both for you. Um, no, look. I mean, I think, as I said, when it, especially now, if you're if you're able if you're able to get you know more than what you're asking for, get it right. That that's that's for sure. Uh, valuation is something that can always be negotiated, discussed. There are many other ways and conditions where you can get the money, but you can, you know, uh, protect yourself a bit. Um, so, uh, and make, make sure you get, you know, you, sure. you vet the investor because, you know, some investors bring in a lot of baggage, some investments bring in a lot of investors bring in, you know, uh, a lot of help. And, and so, it's not just about the money, it's who's giving you the money. Actually on that, and this is a more recent and common occurrence, you might think you've uh, verbally got a commitment. Sometimes you might even think you've got a written commitment, but until the cash is in the bank, sometimes uh, people are walking away. So you have to be very sensitive about the timing of when that money actually lands and if it lands. Have you been through that as, as well? I mean, I had, uh, we I definitely had some friends that have shown me that there were term sheets signed and still the money didn't come. We didn't get that far. We, but we definitely have gotten to initial memorandum of understanding and 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 you know get get agreements. But at you know down the road, somebody changes their mind or there was a misunderstanding at some level. Um, 
as I said, it's not done till the money's in the bank. And, uh, and that's what you really kind of count uh, on. And you keep on hustling, you keep on working, you keep on following through until the money's in the bank. And once it's in the bank, you get ready yeah. for the next round. <laughs> Agreed. So I would love to hear the most, and, and I can tell you my, my side of it is your, your, your best moment in, in this journey and the worst moment kind of like, you know, what, what do you remember as something you like, wow. And what do you remember as something, you know, I don't want to be a founder anymore. Look, I mean, I, I, my, uh, career or my, my, uh, choices may be different. There's a lot of uh, people that have jumped into entrepreneurship from the very beginning. I, after 20 plus years in corporate life, I decided to go into setting, starting something my, on my own. So, uh, uh, and, and it was after I, I was running a $250 million company, right? So uh, a multinational company. So there are challenges when you're running your own startups and at some point in time you say what uh how did i do to myself right and and uh from from having to go and and, and setting up your own uh, office and and uh, getting everything ready for it to dealing with different uh you know personalities and so on but at the end of the day when you've accomplished you know what you set out to do um it's it's definitely all worth it um uh, my, my uh, I would say my, my very high right now is the acquisition. I mean, that, that acquisition has really validated a lot of things that we have done. We were able to, you know, people that have invested very early on with us and trusted us with their money have gotten, got their returns. And that was a phenomenal feeling to be able to see them, you know, uh, getting, uh, appreciating that effort. Um, uh, and and our team members, right? They, that have started with us from the very beginning, and also you know getting something you know tangible, besides just our gratitude and our appreciation. So so uh, that's uh, that's been definitely a, a a high point. But tell me about yours. What what do you if I, in, as an investor? What's a high point and what's a low point? Let's start with the bad first, right? So the low points are always when you make when you made a mistake right when you made a mistake um so so i guess my i have two low points i have one one low point where i trusted a business and one low point where i trusted a founder both of which i was so sure i was right i was so sure i'd done everything about me say this is perfect and then i, I turned out to be completely wrong so on the on the first one <laughs> I'd invested in uh, in making lunch boxes in prison, and uh, and and <laughs> and the founder ran away so <laughs> from prison. So so effectively, I I thought I've got a captive audience, but it wasn't. Um, <laughs> so that, that was that was a that was a funny one. On the second one, I invested for eight years with the founder. We built a, a strong relationship, and I found out in the last kind of year and a half, two years. That the founder on the side had used the capital, has used the the IP and built a separate business, spun it off, and I was distracted. You know, eighty percent of his time was going into that second business. And obviously, founder did what he had to do, or she had to do, whatever in that particular case. But it was the fact that I didn't judge it. It was the fact that after it really burnt, that somebody would would do that when you backed them so long for so. For, for if we could have had an easy communication and be very transparent and say hey, either this model doesn't work out or I don't want to be part of this I want to move on but not do it behind the back so so one recommendation to all founders is uh, and, and actually investors is to be as transparent as possible as I mean you have to be transparent if things are not going well be transparent because then you'll get the support and advice uh if you wait till the last minute you're just gonna hit the wall and um it's 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 and it happens again and again hitting the wall happens again and again and again and often it's just because people are afraid of sharing bad news share bad news early let it come out let it help you let the ecosystem or the your stakeholders help you because if you keep it to yourself it's dangerous so anyway that's the the negative side 
the positive side are always the small wins. Like every small win, you the the startup wins a prize in a event. The the team get together because especially when they get revenue wins, uh, that's the ones I love. When you win a big account, uh, especially if it's a B two B and you win, and you know your revenue just flips because the big account comes in. That feeling, that thrive, that kind of that's better than actually when you raise the next money. You know? I feel. For me, that's that's the one I feel. Okay, this this business is being vindicated. This business, uh, uh, the founder is getting what they deserve, and and the customers are talking proudly about it. The proud moment when customers are virally telling each other about how good the business is, or the product is, or the founder is. Those are for me pride moments. And watching that and seeing it and seeing the likes, love it, love it. Yeah. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I think on, the, on, your, on your first point is, is it's very important to just, you know, double click on that. There is a lot of stress. There is a lot of pressure in, in starting, you know, in, in, in starting a venture. And, um, you know, that's why I think a lot of investors advise uh, having co-founders, right? Not only to, because they complement, because they also support each other. But I think the, the other point that you highlighted, which is, if you're getting a lot of pressure, if you're getting challenges, share it, right? Seek support, seek help. It doesn't, you know, uh, take anything away from you when you're sharing challenges. On the, on the contrary, I think, uh, you know, uh, your, your investors would appreciate it and would jump in to go and, and, and do so. Otherwise, I've seen I've seen I've seen uh, founders that are completely collapse, you know, under pressure because they just put it all on their shoulders. And uh, there's just some, some things that are just too big uh, that can't be done. So uh, it's a very important point that you highlighted. Um, I think it's, uh, we should probably go and take a look at the uh, Q&A. I, I started seeing some, yeah, yeah. some questions here. Uh, yeah, there was it, it related to one of the questions, but I, I, it's, uh, but I want to kind of pin it also to you. You know, yeah. valuations, I, I, as an investor, we kind of try to be very, let's call it, uh, very methodological on the on the valuation. There's a certain metric we have to show our our LPs and our investment committee why we're valuing valuing the business at X. But as a founder, when you're doing the valuations, how does it work for you when you have when you're being squeezed on the valuation or when you can really grow your valuation? You know how 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 did you determine valuations and how did you kind of go through that journey as well? Look, I'm. I'm talk myself about myself now i'm a very pragmatic person right so i'm not uh, gonna go and evaluate this emotionally and that's that's my approach i i recognize that you know uh, uh, cash is the fuel of the company the growth growth of the company and whether you know um, I, i've got this much of the pie or i got just a little bit less than if I don't get the cash, I won't be able to have a pie to begin with. And so for me, it's crucial that, you know, uh, facilitate the, the investment to happen on time when it's needed, rather than just let the business struggle. Because I've seen, you know, uh, when, when business has to go and, and manage cash and, and really, you know, uh, uh, cut down on a lot of crucial expenses, is they're just shooting themselves, so you don't want to you don't want to get yourself into that into that just because you're trying to fight on a certain uh, valuation. Having said that, there is also an assessment of you know what what domain are you in? Are you in very high demand? Right? Are you one of those uh, uh, areas that everybody wants to go after you? What's the economical situation? Is everybody you know uh, going and seeking? to invest in companies or are you in a time where right now when when you know cash is uh, is rare or 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 uh, you know tough to get by so yeah practical end of the day, you want to keep growing your business you want to you know keep uh, uh, fueling that growth um, the most difficult part is at the very beginning and I would say at the very beginning, I've always said, okay, well, there is, there is you know, the, the, the novelty of the idea. Uh, 
There is the uh, what you bring to the picture with regards to whether it's us, you know, skill sets, know how, uh, competitive edge relationships. Uh, and then there is the value or, or the rarity of cash and, and how much that is having a significant impact on your business. And looking at it pragmatically, you come up to the right uh, valuation. There are so, industries where there are multipliers, but I, as you said, I think that's more towards yeah. the later on stages. So I'm, I was just looking at the a question that just came in around the founder salaries and how you think about it. So I'll, I'll give my thoughts and, and you bit from the other side would love to hear your thoughts. So as investors, especially in early stage uh, businesses, we look at two important things. One, obviously, what can the business afford to in terms of not only how much has it raised, but what, how do the economics look like? And second is, what does the founder need to survive? So, you know, the founder need, has a family, has a certain uh, a minimum requirement that they must have. So there's a minimum and there's a maximum and, and there's a kind of uh, uh, in between. But we've, we've seen founders take zero salary for a long time. We've seen founders take a large salary and and often large salaries are just frowned upon for sure for mm-hmm. investors, especially when the founder has a large equity pie and we're valuing the business with a significant premium over what the actual cash situation is. So, so we would never expect a founder to take a fat, fat check. You're making it for your equity. You're not making it for the check, but you, you still need to take enough to, to not be stressed out about life. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think the the uh, the fat salary doesn't make any sense, right? From a, from a, from an entrepreneur or from a a uh, an investor point of view, uh, but I agree with you. I've heard of the stories um, with regards to you know uh, how much it's a person, and it's also a a uh, you know what? What? How much equity you want to go and 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 take on? Because at the end of the day, whatever cash is going in, is taking away equity. Um, so yeah, that's that's the thing. The the there was one question I saw here about you know how do you how do you uh, start a business? How do you get funding for a business when you just have an idea and you're not even able to validate it, right? And you can you don't have the, the funds to go and, and, and validate it. Um, I think it's a great, it's a great uh, question because you know, we are in a market that costs money to go and uh, start something and validate it, right? It's not uh, uh, like in the US where we say, well, I, I started this business in my basement and I know what $2,000 were able to, I find it hard to believe that anybody can do that here just because it, it, it does, you know, there's a cost associated with everything. So um, if you're unable to pitch your idea to a VC that is willing to go to, you know, seed level or then angels uh, or friends and family, right? But I, I think you have to get uh, the funding from somewhere to be able to validate it. There are there are a number of investors that are willing to go in at such high you know risk at the very early because they're looking and you know in, in the investor's eyes and they're interested more in the idea and the investor than the traction. But that's my perspective. I, mean, I think that I, I think they're probably more interested in your perspective, Kush, on this one also. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, the the it, now there's a lot of accelerators and you get a lot from those accelerators beyond just the cash. It's, it's also being, you all have to, by the way, everybody has to watch the movie We Crashed, right? If I, the, the series, you have to watch We Crashed because it's, uh, it gives you a classic feeling of, of everything up and down and a classic feeling of how to be a hustler in this situation. So there is a, all, inter, all entrepreneurs, all founders need to have the hustle in them. And that hustle, especially at the beginning, is critical to win your first investors to win your first orders to win you even to attract the employees i remember in we crashed there was a point when he's trying to attract the first two employees and you know the employees were like asking questions and uh, you know that that whole that whole play is is critical that whole day is very critical so i don't want to answer differently from you yeah. 
And small. and you can and you can apply to thaiwoman.org for the hundred thousand uh, <laughs> dollar prize. So it's a, it's a shameless plug there. Let's see what else we got here. Some questions. Some questions. I think there was a question about the crowdfunding platform. We we use Eureka, but I think uh, you know there are a number of others that are also there. And as I said, to pre to prepare, just make sure you're ready. That you've done the due diligence. You're ready to explain your your business model very simply. You're able to uh, have done the, enough business development behind the scenes to raise about 30% of what you're looking for so that you can provide that traction and that momentum coming through. Um, as the question, this is, this is, you know, we, we talked about, you know, the dilution stage. We talked about, you asked about the valuation. But is there is there a rule of thumb of dilution levels at the yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I would say, look, every major raise you do, and when I say major raise, let's assume there's a C, A, B, C, D, or whatever the alphabet is. But every major raise, the rule of thumb typically is you dilute between fifteen and maximum twenty five percent. So that's a kind of rule of thumb. Now, of course, sometimes there's a bridge to that because you're you're diff, you're not raising enough money, so and you can't you know go and say okay that 100k equals a 20% dilution, and and so you're bridging into it. But typically, each round is a 15 to 25% dilution. That's the rule of thumb, and depending if you're a let's call it a founder team that doesn't have anything else to worry about. Sometimes you have these company studios, studio builders or company builders where the founders have a very small stake and there's a corporate or something else that has a much larger stake. So in that case, the founders have would then have to earn some sort of ESOP over time. Uh, so, and there are times when we've had to restrike, there was a business that completely pivoted. In the process of pivoting, the founder gave up a large amount of his equity to the people who supported him in the pivot. But over time, as his business grew, we basically gave the founder a lot of restructuring shares. We even gave the founder a loan to buy back some shares on the, on the secondary, et cetera. And then later on, you know, the founder got back a, a decent equity share. So that dilution- You want, you want him to be vested. It's absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Look, you're you're investing in. I know you 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 look at a lot of tech-based uh, companies. Um, uh, one of the questions here is: Would would service-oriented companies be interesting for you? Yeah, I mean, when you say service nowadays, there's tech in everything, right? So, service, whether it's a logistic service, whether it's a, I don't know, cut my hair service, whether it's. A, any form of service, there's always some kind of friction that and that customers go through. And the tech side is how do you reduce that friction? Are you, is it the booking side of it? Is it the, the uh, who you're talking, the concierge side of it? It's, there's always some form of friction you're trying to remove. The stronger, the, the more layers there are in that friction, the more you remove, the more margins you have. So we've seen we've seen situations where the service side of a product business is taking 50 percent of the total uh, product value so if you're selling something at 100 the product's worth 50 the service is worth 50 but the reason the service was worth 50 is because it's so complicated so if you can remove that complication definitely 100 percent uh, I, I just you know picking on that second part of the question because it's it's wrong because you, you ask, is it always product and IP that attracts investors? And in reality, they're not looking at products and, and it's, it's more of a, a business model and where that business model can, you know, whether it's the, the you know, tech fueled for scalability, um, IP is fantastic to have and because it provides you a competitive edge, you can't always have specific IP that's registered, but you can have IP in how you do business, some internal, you know, know how process thing like that. So I would, I would uh, just advise whoever is asking, you know, it's not about product, it's more about the business model. And, 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 and yes, as you said, technology is, is the accelerator, it removes the friction, allows you to scale. 
but it's not necessarily, you know, product or versus service. And a, and, and a comment on IP, et cetera. I, I don't know if we have enough time, but if you take, let's call it deep, deep, deep tech, I'm talking about deep tech, like, I don't know, growing food, <laughs> food on spacecraft or something, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, this, this deep tech is real IP, right? That's where it takes a long time to build the IP. That IP is almost, it is patented. It needs to be patented. Somebody threw in a lot of effort and probably university professors involved and all sorts of uh, support systems involved to make that happen. That's different. And, and it's not often in our region or, or, or here we we'll be chasing that kind of, or looking for that kind of IP. And when you do find that kind of IP, it's unlikely that it's going to have fast revenue. It's going to need to be protected. It's, not, it's, it's going to need to have some sort of regulations to drive it going forward. It has a, a big moat around it. So the revenue is less of an issue. The valuations are driven by how strong that IP is. But I think we're, we're, we don't often come across that here. Yeah, I agree. I agree. There is a question I'm going to try to, you know, um, creatives, right? People who are creative in nature, they have, a, they have a value to add and to provide how can they, you know, there's a feeling that there's not a lot, there's not a lot of investment available for them to go and build something and grow something. Anything that you have to advise for them? Yeah, I mean, just like the gig economy, now we have the creator economy. And uh, so the, first there's the, let's call it the TikTok world and the, the um, influencers, the etc. So that's not necessarily a business, but you've got You've got the ability to, to earn money because creative people typically have followers. Creative people are trendy. Creative people, uh, people, people want to get attracted to them. And, and, and that, has, <laughs> that has a market. And that market, how do you leverage that market? How do you put tech behind it? How do you get brands to support you because you, you bring uh, the same eyeballs to the brands, etc. So that's that's a big thing for the creator economy. Then the other thing I, I like to joke about is if any of you have used uh, this app called House, H-O-U-Z-Z. -Z, uh, so you basically, it's like Tinder for choosing furniture or it's Tinder for your house, you know, furnishing your house, et cetera. It's so creative in the way they do it. There's so much AI, but it's at the same time you find it fits your own profile. It fits the segments you're looking at. Your, it, they get to learn what I like and what so creative people should also take what they're really good at, figure out who's, who is going to get attracted to that and how they can build a business model around that. 100%. Look, and, and I'm, I'm reading through some of the questions as you're talking, and, and just to highlight to people, I mean, VCs have a mandate that they need to, at least, if they don't see a potential of bringing back 20 times their investment, correct me if I'm wrong, Kush, right? Uh, then they would they couldn't go in because of the failure ratios and and the, and the mandate to, to return to uh, for, for the ROI. So if you have an idea, if you have a business, but you yourself cannot show that there are these significant potential returns, that doesn't mean that you you cannot get investment. It's just that VC may not be the the right place to go to. And again, there are. You know other forms of investors that can can provide you the funding for what you're trying to do so whether it is a service-based business whether it is something else uh it's all about the potential returns you can show the investor that they can make and that opens up different types of uh, investment channels for you i'm gonna switch because there's an interesting question there which is specific for you which is Let's call it post the exit journey, which you've reached. You've now, you kind of, you're still running the business. Tell us how yeah. the post exit uh, feels like, looks like, what does it mean? You know, how long do you get tied for? What does that mean for you? I mean, so, so typically there is a, you know, a handover period, right? They want to make sure that the business model, the business is uh, stable. There are, there is a succession, uh, uh, team and place and the you know when you sold the business um either they bought it based on your current valuation of what you've already accomplished or on some 
future plans that you have said that you're going to do. So if it's if it's based on future, then they're most likely going to ask you to hang around and to go and fulfill that future that you've promised them. And, you know, in return for a retainer or some kind of a, a bonus plan. But if it's based on what you've already accomplished, then it's a shorter duration to just make sure you hand it over to either an existing team or to someone else. Um, but, you know, founders who have spent, you know, a long period of time and growing and making the decisions quite, you know, uh, agile, uh, in an agile way, it's very difficult for them to now switch over to a corporate run, you know, operation. Um, I have the advantage that I've, I was there, so I'm familiar with it, but it does, not everybody is in the same space. So don't assume that you can make that switch and stand, stay in there for a very long time. Uh, make sure you count on it as a transition, identify your successors, grow them, coach them, build them up. And that's that's quite important. Excellent. Um, I, I was just, uh, where is it gone? Uh, so it wasn't about, the, there's a lot of questions around valuations, but we can take that separately. Um, ah, completely lost it. Was it about the balance or something else? No, there, there, okay, there's one bit about how much time you spend fundraising versus running the business. What does that mean? And, you know, obviously that, I mean, you, you know yourself, <laughs> it's probably a 50-50, you gotta do both. It's a, for, for me, the one thing I warn all founders, early bird, budding founders is, this takes over your life. This is like having a baby and the baby stays a baby. It's, the baby does not grow up. It just has different forms of babiness. <laughs> so I let you describe it in as a founder. No, 100%. Make sure your family's on board with the decision because they're going to be, you know, uh, just as big of a contributor to the success or failure of it. You know, if they're not on board, there is a lot of commitment on their side and they, there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot less of you available for them. So just make sure that that is the case. And as you said, it's, it's a baby that stays a baby for a very long time. Um, and then there was a question around, what if an investor disappears on you, doesn't start responding? First of all, that's gonna happen all the time. This is not a, this is not a surprise. You will, investors, some investors will always show more excitement than they really mean. Uh, or they will have so many things on their plate that they they can't they, to prioritize, even if you're a great business and they don't have the time to understand it or they don't have the time to kind of dig deeper, et cetera, you, you'll miss out. And so you you try everything you can. And typically the one once or twice, what has worked is if you have a product, you know, like that El Grosse back, you, you send it to them. <laughs> one day you wake them up and you, it's a delivery at your house and it says, hey, uh, and 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 then they feel obliged because you've sent them a little. I know, I know, it's a little bit of a small bribe, but uh, you, you know, you have to play that game. That's the hustle. And 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 be. I mean, look, it's it's <laughs> it sucks, but be ready for some, you know, scrupulous and and, and weird behaviors. Right? There are some investors that would reach out to you as part of their market research of just getting additional data about what this the landscape of the market is. And it all depends on, you know, are you hungry? Do you need to talk to everybody right now or you don't? Um, I wish I could tell you, you know, only talk to uh, people who are 100% guaranteed, have signed the NDAs and all. Reality is you're gonna have to be very flexible and you're going to make, you know, the judgment call and take the risk uh, because at the end of the day, you need to keep growing the business. I think we've run out of time. So, but we, yep. on valuations, exactly. We're happy to perhaps have a separate session and probably there are more people out in the Thai group who can support that session as well. So there's plenty of rules for valuation. Happy to support that. Sicily or, or Thai Dubai, if there's anything else you want us to cover, please let us know. 
No, I think it's all good. There's a lot of questions that are left, uh, but we are out of time. And I think that we should have an in-person session <laughs> because uh, the kind of questions, and I think a lot of people want to, you know, ask their own things as well. So if you're open sure. to anybody connecting to you, or we can direct it through Thai Dubai as well. So we'll share, sure. you can email Thai Dubai at thaidubai.org, be specific what you're looking for, then it would, because if it's too generic, then it just gets lost as well. So I'm so, happy to have a in-person coffee session after the summer. <laughs> so yes, let's, yes. Let's yes, make yes. it when it's a bit cooler, a bit more outdoory. So absolutely, absolutely. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, both of you, for keeping it candid and sharing both your journeys. And uh, uh, have a lovely evening, everybody. Thank, Thank you, guys. So Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye.